most of you, I'm hoping, would know of Jebediah and Bob Evans. Hands up if you don't. Ah, see, there we go. All right, so we don't need to go being, down that track either. I think they were being polite. Yeah. <laughs> um, just give us a little bit of background about where Jebediah came from and where Bob Evans came from and why we have this separation. Uh, sure. Um, so Jebediah was my first and pretty much only band that I've played in. So we formed in 1995, which was the year that I, uh, after finishing high school, we were all mates at high school. The drummer's my brother. Um, and we were all at the same university, uh, Murdoch University in Perth at the time. None of us completed our degrees. Um, and we entered the campus band, national campus band competition, which we ended up winning. And um, that was that's sort of a, you know, a very sort of brief kind of idea of how we first kind of got our foot in the door. Then it all sort of happened very quickly after that. Um, and then soon after that, probably about 98, 99, was when I started um, playing shows uh, as Bob Evans. Now, I called myself Bob Evans because by the time I started doing that, Jebediah had become quite popular. And I was writing these songs that weren't Jebediah songs that I wanted to perform. And, you know, I was... Uh, you, I, I basically, I didn't want to do a gig and have a whole heap of kids rock up expecting to hear Jebediah songs played solo acoustics. That's not what I wanted to do. So I gave myself the name Bob Evans pretty much as a disguise to, to kind of go incognito. And so for about five years, I reckon I was just playing like these gigs to, to, to nobody, uh, to my housemates and my mum and the bar staff. You know, down at the Grosvenor Hotel on a Wednesday night or whatever, um, doing the odd sort of support. And um, and so, yeah, I guess, like, the motivation there was to start again um, and not sort of trade off the popularity of Jebediah at that point in time. So it kind of worked well in that sense because I, I'm, my first record I made in 2003 is Bob Evans and... Just did it put out on our own label. Jebediah was, was signed to Sony at the time. Um, so I just kept it very, very um, separate. Um, so it wasn't until 2006 that Bob Evans started to kind of have some success. And But there was a long gestation period, I guess, is what I'm trying to kind of get to. And and, it, and it's sort of the two things of Bob Evans and Jebediah have operated quite separately ever since because of that sort of groundwork, I guess. They are very different styles of music. Yeah. Now, w your creative process, how do you decide that you're going to write a song for either Jeb or for, for Bob Evans? Um, well, I guess the short answer is I don't. Um, you know, I try not to talk in sort of airy-fairy terms about songwriting because I don't want to sort of propel this myth that it's, you know, some kind of magic that happens. Um, but when I write songs, I'm not really writing with anything in mind in terms of, is this Jebediah, is this Bob Evans? I, I start writing and, and the song kind of dictates. Um, so the song tells me um, where it wants to go. Do you tend to start with lyrics or poetry or a, a melody or a bass line? Where does it come from? Uh, almost never start with lyrics. Um, so my process between music and lyrics is very, very different. Um, and, you know, I'm not sure how much this will help people. <laughs> but um, the music side of things, melody, that's always come really easily to me. Um, that's the easy bit. That's the bit that's, that's not work. You know, um, I have music and melody going in and out of my head pretty much all the time and have done since I was about 12. Um, lyric writing, that's the work. That's the hard bit. And when I first started writing songs, I wasn't really that interested in lyrics. I was just interested in melody and, you know, a, a catchy tune. Um, 
And if you listen to some of the lyrics on the first Jebel I record, that will become abundantly clear. <laughs> um, but uh, lyrics are something that I've grown to appreciate as I've matured. Um, and as I've discovered more music and, and you know, my, my taste in music has evolved and changed, obviously, since I was a teenager. And, um, and the lyric writing became more and more important. And now to the point where I'm 45 years old and, and the lyrics are almost probably more important to me now than the music side of things. So I've kind of done a bit of an about <laughs> face in a way. But, um, but the lyrics are hard work. That's the stuff where I have to sit down and do the work. And that could be days, it could be weeks, it could be months. In some cases, it can even be years before I've um, written lyrics that I like. But, um, but lyrics aren't throwaway to me anymore. Um, now, it's really important to me that, um, it's, you know, I want a song to be memorable, melodically memorable to people. I think that's really, really important. But um, I also want to say something as well. So are you writing songs that mean something to you and hopefully mean something to other people mm. or are you trying to write songs that are going to be a hit? <laughs> I don't think I've ever written songs trying to write a hit. I, I think I was fortunate in the sense that the first Jebediah record had a number of what could be classified as hits, um, even though it wasn't like we got played on commercial radio much. But... Um, but back in those days, you know, you, being played on Triple J, you, you could sell a lot of records. Um, that's all changed now. It's streaming and whatnot. But um, so, you know, which is interesting aside, you know, you can... A hit song used to be all about radio, but nowadays you can have a hit song just on Spotify or whatever and not even be played on the radio. So the, the whole environment's changed and shifted. Um, but I think because of that natural uh, m sort of melodic uh, thing that I've always kind of had, I I've always found it pretty easy to write memorable sounding songs. And so um, without trying to write hits, we managed to get a few. Um, I, I know that there are people that, you know, who go about the business of, trying to write hits and, and are successful at doing that too. So obviously there's a technique that can be employed and it's not, I'm sure it's not guaranteed. But, um, but for me, I was, you know, my interest was always just in writing a song that I really liked, that I remembered, that excited me. And I suppose I was lucky in that I've quickly learned that, you know, if a song excited me, then it turns out that there was, it, would, it was going to excite at least a few other people as well. So I just but relied on that. That's a really interesting point. You've got this baby that you've created and you're in love with it because it's magic and it, it's everything you wanted it to be. And then you go into the band scenario and your fellow band members go, oh, we need to change this and this and I don't like that lyric and let's change that chord. <laughs> How do you deal with that? Yeah, well, I mean, that's collaboration really, isn't it? And I guess that's something that we're all going to um, experience soon. But... Um, you know, with the band, um, it was all, we were we were friends first. We formed a band because we were already mates, and so um, so the emphasis was at first was really just about having a good time. It wasn't you know we weren't trying to write the greatest song in the world or become the biggest band in the world. Or, we were just trying to have a good time and play some gigs for fun. So our ambitions were very modest. So I suppose, and back then, you know, I guess. I was writing songs, but I didn't cons consider myself as like a, an artist or even a songwriter as such. It wasn't like my career at that point in time. So I guess um, the collaborative process was wrapped up in just friends, you know, having fun. I wasn't precious, I guess is, what the, I guess is where I was kind of going with that. I wasn't precious about it. I'm, I'm a lot more precious about it now. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, when it comes to collaboration and stuff, you know, I, I kind of it can be a humbling experience sometimes because I I I came to learn pretty quickly with Jebediah that um even though I was kind of writing these songs the 
part of the what made them successful, I believe, is not all wrapped up just in the song, it was in the presentation. And I know we're here to, to talk about songwriting and so this is kind of an extension of that. may not be entirely relevant, but, um, but I'm pretty sure that the songs wouldn't have been as successful if it had just been me. I think we, you know, having a, you know, someone like Vanessa playing, ba having a female bass player in the 90s was attractive to a lot of people. It made Jebediah look cooler. It made the songs look cooler. <laughs> um, and everybody's input into the music turned it, made it what Jeb made it Jebediah, right? If it was just me telling everybody what to do, it would have sounded different mm. and, it, and it may not have been as, as good. So I think you have to kind of, we well, don't have to, but I think you can choose to sort of invite that into your world and kind of go, well, you know, if, you, if you're making music with people that you really enjoy spending time with, well, then it's possible that you can create something quite different to what you imagined, but maybe better. You know, it might, it might, have, might make it more unique or more special because of the chemistry of the people involved, you know. You mentioned this being your career. Have now. you, yeah. So <laughs> have you gotten to a point where you now think that you, it's become a job as opposed to just something that you love doing? I mean, you've got to keep getting the income or otherwise you're going to have to go and get a real job gutting fish or digging holes or something like that. Yeah. It's a scary prospect, isn't it? Um, yeah, it's a funny thing, you know, that, when you are doing something that you love, that you know you do in your spare time, and then it you know slowly kind of morphs into a career and a job and your source of income, and and then you get to the stage where you're in your forties and you have got no other skills, and uh, <laughs> and so um, you know that yeah it does it turns into a job and that does that does take some adjustment and it does affect it does affect. It has affected me. Um, but for you, it's not a nine to five, obviously, because you've got a family life to deal with. And sure. So how do you how do you wrap your creative time around your responsibilities? Well, it's, well, obviously that changes as life changes. Um, in a previous time, you know, I I could uh, spend the day just wandering around the house. Literally, this is what I did. I just have a guitar over my shoulder, and I would just walk around the house playing guitar and coming up with uh, ideas. Sometimes I'd come up with great ideas, sometimes I wouldn't come up with anything. Um, but, I, but because, you know, I was single and didn't have children, and um, even though by that stage I was earning an income from being a musician, I had, you know, a lot of, you know, a lot of spare time <laughs> to, to devote to it. Um, as I've gotten older and, and I had a family and stuff now, it just requires discipline. And that took some adjustment, you know. But that goes back to what I was saying before, you know, that I try, I, I, I try not to kind of invest too much um, into this idea that writing songs and making music is some kind of magic, you know, um, that, like, inspiration, you know, falls from the sky. And, um, you know, I, I think if you, if you invest too much into that idea that it's somehow kind of this magical thing, then you're not taking agency and ownership over your, your craft. So I've come to kind of realise that um, you, can, you can be creative by just showing up, doing the work. So, you know, that, mean, that means that um, I have sp sp very specific times where I can work, you know, which is... At times when now that my kids are at school and before the kids are at school and that would be at night time or whatever but if I set aside blocks of time to work um, it took some adjusting but but it's um, it works just as well and it kind of takes a yeah it, it kind of you you let go of any of those kind of myths that you may have kind of held on to before that um, learning a little bit of discipline in, in yeah. making sure that you sit down and actually do some work, yeah. any work, just to get there. Because, yeah, I think that when I was younger, there was a tendency to think that, like, oh, you know, 
inspiration is something that I can't control or whatever. So, you know, I've just got to wait for, for it to just magically happen. Um, but now I don't kind of subscribe to that thought anymore. I, I think that, like, if, um, you know, if inspiration is something that falls out of the sky, then, you've, then the, your chances of catching it are going to be greater if you're going to work every day. I think it was Thomas Edison that said that genius is 99% perspiration sure. and 1% inspiration. Of course, absolutely. Yeah. And I'm no genius, but that sounds pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> Going back to your creative process, the songwriting process, let's say you've come up with a cracking melody and you've been working along with it and you go and play it for someone and they go, ah, yes, that's Kookaburra Sits in the Old Gum Tree. Right. Yeah. How do you deal with that? Well, I mean, you have to, uh, that happens, it's usually my, I, I usually figure that out before other people tell me. Um, but um, if it's true, well, then you just have to face facts, don't you? Um, I mean, there, there have been times where I've written songs where I've been really concerned that it sounds too much like something else, but I've gone ahead with it anyway, and not a single person has said a thing, mentioned it or picked up on it. And I just think, oh my God, I can't believe nobody kind of heard that like I did. And then there are times where I've written songs where people go, oh, this sounds like that, and that's just not even occurred to me. Yeah. But then, you know, I'll listen to the other song or I'll compare them and I'll, then I'll make up my own mind. Well, it's like, well, you know, does, have I, you know, have I borrowed this? Have I stolen this? How do I feel about that? And then, you know, make up my own mind about what I want to do with that information. <laughs> there are so many songs, though, that have the same chord progressions, for example. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, like, I think that if you, if you really wanted to, you could take any song and find something mm. from another song in it. I don't know. I think that there's a history of songwriting, particularly in the folk kind of world, of like passing things down, you know. Um, and there have been loads of times where I've written songs that have almost been in, in homage <laughs> yeah. to, to, to an artist that I really like, you know? And so wearing influence, I've worn influences on my sleeve before. Um, I think as long as you're not consciously stealing, and if you do borrow, then you credit, <laughs> you make sure that you credit, then, uh, yeah, I think that's probably the only thing that you can really do. We've just had, have a pandemic, how has really? that, <laughs> that affected you and the band and Bob Evans and even your, your process, your creative process? Has it traumatised you in any way, shape or form? Are we going to hear a difference in direction perhaps? Uh, no, I mean, a little bit. I, I was um, in the studio making my last solo record when the pandemic kicked off. So uh, it was the last two weeks of February in 2020 I was in the studio and we finished the record, just as stuff started getting cancelled, and two weeks later, Melbourne was in lockdown, which is where I live now. Um, and so, uh, in a way, I was lucky because I'd just finished making this record, and had I not done it when I did, it, I would have probably had to wait a, a, probably about two years before I could have done it. So, But I ended up releasing the album in 2021, and COVID kicked off again just as I was about to go on tour, and it just, you know, totally kind of derailed everything. Um, I don't, look, I went through a few different stages cr on the, from the creative point of view, you know, where I was kind of faced with this situation where it's like, well, whenever I go into my little writing room, my studio um, to work, I was, I was conscious of the fact, well, anything that I create at the moment has got no, uh, it's, it's going to be, it's going to be potentially years and years and years before it can ever see the line of day. There was a little bit of like, oh, what's the point? Um, but what I did find was that working through that, I was like, well, you know, I used to just write music with no, with no idea of its destination, right? When I first started, for years of when I first started writing songs, I wasn't writing for an album or writing because people were expecting something. I just wrote for fun. So I kind of rediscovered that a little bit. 
of just going, well, you know, I'm just going to write for the sake of writing. Um, so in, in a sense, it was kind of a bit of a blessing in disguise because this, this event forced me to kind of stop and think about um, why I was writing. And, 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 and I think maybe for a long time, I'd sort of been caught up in this cycle of always writing for the next record, for the next record. Um, and so I wrote a bunch of stuff that was really different to anything I'd written before. My, it, it made me reapproach my process, you know, which is probably something that's relevant to what we're here today. You know, like I started thinking, well, you know, why don't I? I'm just going to write songs that start with a drum beat. I, I traditionally always start my music. If if I do start music with an instrument, it's predominantly guitar, sometimes a keyboard or piano or something, but mostly guitar. Um, but I just started started every song on a drum machine and just making drum beats and then using that as the kind of core foundation for, for developing songs. And the, result, the results were really, really different. It made me write in a really different way and made me sort of embrace this idea of just like writing for, no, for just you know, the pleasure of writing, you know, without thinking, oh, is this an album? You know. mm. A lot of conventional music it follows a, a pattern, intro, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge. Sure. Is that the standard that you sort of stick to or are you happy to wiggle your way around that? And um, I, I guess I still use traditional songwriting kind of techniques as a template. Um, although, having said that, I try... N <laughs> I certainly don't... Every song that I write doesn't follow exactly the same formula in terms of, like... If you were to, if you were to say that, like, the most standard template for a song is, like, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, middle eight, chorus, maybe double chorus at the end. So if you just said that, call that, like, you know, the mm -hmm. absolute standard, I try not to do that, <laughs> basically. <laughs> Sometimes I'll write a song and I'll realise after the event, oh, you know, it follows that pattern. Mm. And so I'll try to think, well, is there a way that this can be improved? But um, I find these days I'm writing a lot more outside of that mm. pattern. So I'm still using conventional ideas of like verses and choruses and I still think middle eights have a place in music even though nowadays a lot of modern music seems to have gotten rid of the middle eight. Um, I, I still kind of, I still like the, you know, I'm a fan of the Beatles and all that kind of stuff, you know, so there's an element of traditional songwriting that I'm always, traditional popular songwriting I should say, that, um, that I'll probably that I'll always kind of lean into. Mm. Um, but, but yeah, I find now I'll, I'm more interested in the idea of like, well, you know, a chorus can sometimes be part of a verse. It can be a refrain, yes. you know, rather than a, rather than a chorus. I've written a lot of songs. Some, some of the songs that have been the most successful have been like that. And, but back then it wasn't intentional. I was just kind of doing it. So, there's things that, like, you kind of figure out a lot about your own style and technique after the fact, as you get older. Yeah. You, you know, and that can be useful because you can kind of go, oh, right, okay, I was doing that, and that worked. I wonder mm. if that's something that I can actually use as a technique rather than just always kind of running on instinct all the time. So, yeah, I mean, hopefully that's something today that, mm. you know, can talk about in the workshops. A lot of songs that become quite popular, certainly ones that get airplay, tend to be written in a, in a major key. Um, right. But there are obviously some that, that don't. Um, Military Strongman, for example, I think, is not in a standard, what I would think of as a, as a major key. It, it sounds a little different. Is yeah. that, was that a deliberate choice? No, not at all. Um, that came from um, Chris, the lead guitarist, writing a riff. That went over and over, and me just kind of feeling out what chords, just feeling out a four chord pattern that 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 
cyclical riff mm. worked over. And I mean, that was something that probably is a bit of a, definitely one of the things that I used to do a lot and that is probably a, a kind of a, je a very Jebediah sounding thing is like, you know, we loved riffs, like repetitive, really basic, simple, repetitive riffs that just go over and over. And then like, you know, chord patterns where that, you know, where every time you change the chord, you don't need to change the riff. But it's, it's very, it, it's, there's something about that that the ears really love. Because every time you change a chord, it's, it, it puts the riff into a different context. Mm. And, you know, if you, a three or a four chord pattern that works with the same riff, and you could cross between majors and minors and all that kind of stuff. And then, so every time that riff repeats, it's got a slightly different backing. And there's something about that that, um, you know, is really appealing to the ears. Um, and certainly a lot of Jebediah songs started with that. And then the riff would disappear and the vocals would come in. Mm. You know, and then, you do, and then after the first chorus, back to that riff. Repeat that riff, do it all again. Riff comes out, vocals replace it. Mm. When the vocals come out, riff comes back in. Um, you know, that's a very sort of, uh, you know, punk power, <laughs> pop, punk, rock, whatever you... Yeah genre you want to call it uh, style of doing things that we did that a lot military astronomy definitely is part of one of those songs i'm frustrated perhaps not as frustrated as you as you I, i've worked in commercial radio a long long time okay. and we don't play nearly enough local music mm -hmm. and a lot of the jebediah stuff in particular was extremely radio friendly and yet it was the music directors would never put it on the playlists. And no matter how much a lot of the presenters would ask for that kind of content to go on there, a lot of the programming is kind of enforced and you, there's no choice. And mm. I don't know how much of it comes from the, directly from the record companies, you know, you must play this, we want you to play this, that kind of thing. I don't know if that happens anymore. But mm. how frustrating is it for you that some of the stuff that you consider your best work just doesn't get the airplay? Um. Oh, look, I don't get frustrated about that really because, you know, I think we have, to, you know, I'm grateful for, for um, the, you know, we, we were supported on radio for a long, long time, so I'm not going to, I'm, I'm happy with that. Um, these days it seems like um, radio has become even more homogenised because it all, I mean, a few years ago at least there was a bit of difference between radio in Queensland and radio in WA and radio in Victoria, whatever, whereas now, you know, all the commercial radio stations are all centralised, come from this sort of centralised point. So what you hear in Queensland is from a radio station is exactly the same as you're going to hear in WA and South Australia and everywhere else. Um, I think that, you know, what's frustrating to me is that, um, you know, and commercial radio, I guess, is the sort of worst at this, is that um, they, don't, uh, they don't play... There are Australian music quotas that they that they do uh, are supposed to kind of um, live by. And whether they actually do or not is is questionable. And if they do, it's mostly um, Australian music that from you know decades ago, right? So a lot of commercial radio stations will seem. This is just my opinion. You know, they seem to fill up their Australian music quota with the same stuff that they've been playing since 1985 or whatever. Um, so that, isn't, that doesn't provide a very good breeding ground for new music to come through. And I think it's a shame that, you know, Australia still seems to, um, seems to lean so heavily on American popular culture and to a lesser extent from the UK as well. But... Um, and that we don't have more Australian music, you know, being pushed. Um, you know, Triple J obviously does a pretty good job at that and always has, but, you know, but they're a public broadcaster. It's, you know, if the government wasn't in charge, that probably wouldn't be the case. But, um, but yeah, that, that frustrates me, you know, because um, I think we should, you know... The, although, you know, at the same time, when I think about the way that streaming has kind of come into the world now and is making radio less and less relevant, I think a lot of people are discovering music these days from from streaming. 
But does it feel you inspire you when you can see the exact numbers of people that have streamed a new song or are looking back at the older stuff? And, and I guess subsequent to that question, can you make the same amount of money out of streaming that you did mm. previously? No, I mean, you don't make much money out of streaming. I think everyone would know that. What is it, like 0 0.00? I don't know, I can't... Add another zero, yeah. Um, so the only people making money for streaming are people that are getting into, what, the hundreds of millions, probably? You might start making, seeing, seeing some, s a difference in your royalty checks. Um, so, yeah, that side of things, you know, isn't, isn't great, but... Oh, so yeah. does that come you know, down to history like... Of, there's, a, there's a long history of artists being ripped off, yeah, right? Yeah, And it's always been like this. They've always been at the bottom of the pile. Yeah. Um, whether and you know record companies are uh, absolutely responsible, um, are partly responsible for that. Um, I think that with, I think that it's possible that there will be more equity in that world of streaming as it continues to grow. I, I'm, I feel a little bit hopeful um, that it's still a fairly new technology and that um, in time that may change. And you know. Even though artists aren't necessarily making a huge amount of money from streaming at the moment, I can also see the benefits um, that it has in it, just the ability to... I mean, when I first started out, the idea that you could make a song in your bedroom and it could be heard by someone in Finland was just... So people have access now to out stuff of my that they never yeah, have yeah. access to Yeah, that's before. right. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's incredible. Yeah. Um, so you making money now really comes down to things like live performance and sure. merch. Absolutely, um, more than ever. Mm. Uh, and, you know, thinking about the COVID, you know, I think the reason why COVID really hit musicians, the working musicians, so hard was that we'd arrived at this point in time where so much of our income was based on live performance. If COVID had happened in 1999, 2000, you know, I think back and think, oh, well, you know, probably could have, you know, Jeb and I were probably in a place where we might have been able to just kind of get by on, mm. on royalties and, you know, not comfortably, but would have made a difference. Whereas now it's just like that makes up such a small part of yeah. my income. The live music and, and merchandise to an extent um, makes up a huge part. And when you get rid of that, it's very, very difficult. I've got one more question for you and then okay. we'll actually take some questions from the floor. Um, <laughs> I think about some of the, the merch and stuff that you've got out there. Is, is, there, is there anything in the band's career, in Bob Evans' career, that you regret? In, what, in terms of songs or, or merch anything? or, oh, or God, anything at hey. all? I mean, you know, it's funny when people talk about, you know, do you have any regrets? And, you know, there, is, there are people that will say, oh, no, you know, life's too short for regrets. I don't have any regrets. I, go, <laughs> I mean, no, I should rephrase that. I don't live... With regret, right? I don't spend my days regretting things. So it's more like if if I could have my time again, would I do some things differently? Fuck yes. <laughs> Fuck yes. Absolutely. But I but I don't spend my time worrying about it now. Yeah. yeah. But I, but yeah, if I could go back and change some things for sure. Just, and it's just decisions, you know, like putting, you know, that's choosing to. The very first Jeb and I record, we put on a, a, a song on the record because we thought um, it may it, it was a it, it was a it was a crap song basically, um, but it was different to the, all the other ones. And we were like, oh, well, you know, we need to sort of have something that sounds different and showcase it. I bet somebody loves it though. I doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> no, nobody likes it. Um, <laughs> I hate it, and. Um, and we had better songs that, you know, could have made that album even stronger. Um, but, you know, that was just because we were young and didn't know what we were doing. Um, go on, what song was it? I'm going to go and listen. It's, called, it's a song called Twilight Equals Dusk. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so stupid. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, I definitely, if I had my time again, I'd get rid of that and put a different song on. Would you but ever re-record a song? Uh... Uh, only if someone was paying me a lot. <laughs> if it was, but no, because uh, I mean, I, I mean, even just rehearsing old songs, I find really laborious. Yeah. 
you know, it's something that that's that's the work side of things is like rehearsing songs up. I love, you know, people often say, oh, gee, you know, what's it like playing, you know, leaving home or whatever songs that I wrote as a teenager and I'm still performing live. And on stage, I love, I still love it. It's the best, but I can't stand rehearsing them. Yeah. It's that's really boring. <laughs> you, you've got a heap of songs with Jebediah and with Bob Evans. How many have you got stashed away that we've never heard? Oh, God, hundreds and hundreds. Um, I have a folder on my desktop, unreleased songs, and Jesus Christ, just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. So when are we going to hear them all? Probably, well, you know, most of them never. <laughs> um, you know, there are songs stretching back years, you know, and every now and then I revisit it and go through. Sometimes, you know, if I've got, I just don't have any sort of ideas, I'll be like, oh, I'll, I'll go through my, you know, go through the old scrapbook and see what if there's anything there that I feel inspired to work on. Um, and, yeah, there are songs going back like 20 years. Um, but, you know, they're still there. <laughs> well, thank you for letting me interrogate you. Um, has thank anybody you. got any questions they'd like to ask Kev? Not everybody all at once. Settle down. Uh, did, did you ever find you'd rip yourself off? <laughs> 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 um, yeah. I don't know if it's possible to rip yourself off. Um, I've definitely... There have been times where I've where there's like a, where I've written a type of song, I've written a song that I've really, really loved and I've wanted to kind of write uh, just for my own pleasure and enjoyment, I've wanted to keep revisiting that. And I'm thinking of a song, uh, it's a Bob Evans song called Nowhere Without You and it's a piano-based song and, it, and it's got a very distinctive kind of, you know, it's a dum, bum, bum, bum kind of rhythm which I kind of was, you know, which kind of comes from a little bit from that John Lennon song, Instant Karma. Instant Karma, you know, the bomb, 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 piano type song, right? And I've wanted to rewrite that song over and over and over because it's so much fun. But, um, but whenever I demo a song like that, and, or certainly on the album after that, I had a song that was really, it's really, really good, but pretty similar, and the producer was like, you can't do that. It's like, it sounds too much like No Over There. And so I was like, mm. Well, it's true. He's right, um, and he's produ And I'm, you know, this guy's getting paid to produce the record, so I guess. So yeah, so I've taken that advice. So yeah, I suppose you know, um, there. Are, sure, yeah, there are times where I am inclined to repeat myself, um, but you know, like there's nothing inherently wrong with that. I mean, do what you want at the end of the day. Um, but uh, but yeah, I mean, I guess if sometimes you know people, there might be people that come along, and come into my world. There are a very small number of people that I will let give me adv advice, and if they say, "Oh, it sounds just too much like this other one," and if I know that they're right, then I'll be like, "Oh well, okay, maybe there's room for something different there." I know we're like all Twilight equals stuff. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I know we're all pretty much grown ups now, so it doesn't really matter too much. But what are your thoughts about obscenity and swearing in song lyrics? Um, I uh, well, it's a, uh, I, I probably I've probably swore I probably do it less now than I used to. Um, I don't think there's I mean again say whatever you want. I mean sometimes a, you know sometimes a let and rip with a good fuck is the best way to express yourself. Um, but for me personally, I find most of the time it's not. I'm not sure a loud fuck right in the middle of a good Bob Evans song is really going to work that well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's all about context. <laughs> it's all about context. But, um, but no, I mean, like I was saying at the start, you know, I, I'm, the lyrics have become more important to me. And yeah. so, um, you know, uh, 99 percent of the time I feel like you know uh, using a swear word is usually uh, kind of a easy way out there's more um, more poetic ways but you know there is always a place for a good swear word mm. 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 
yeah. And the way we discovered who banned was taking the mic. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that gig. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was the only way we saw any music really now. And um, yeah, so we would always have to have something recorded to then go on tour so that you've got something mm. to follow up your sales or is that um well Yeah, well I mean obviously once you've been around for a while, yeah, you, you do you enter into a kind of s cyclical kind of uh, thing where, where you, you yeah you we generally kind of don't uh, play new songs until after we've recorded them, but yeah what you're talking about is like discovering stuff right at the at the grassroots. Mm. Um, no, I think the songs still come together in a way. I, th I think there's definitely... Uh, I have, in more recent times, kind of rediscovered the value in playing s new songs live a bit before going into the studio. Because I have been caught a few times where I've made a record and, fin and, and it's full of songs that I've never played live before. They've only ever ex sort of existed in a studio setting. And, and then when I go out to play them, um, I f find that I'm not as connected to them, or like, a, or they're not worn in, and sometimes it can really help to like play songs live a heap before going into the studio, um, because you kind of get to know them a little bit better. I think like playing a song live, you know, is 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 worth you know thirty times in your bedroom right because like, that one time is and it's not so much necessarily about like finding out what, how people are reacting to it obviously like if people react really strongly to a song when they hear it that's that's great but you're not always going to get that it doesn't mean it's not a good song um but yeah i have discovered more recently that like wearing wearing songs in a little bit live before recording them can be really really useful but yeah in terms of like discovering stuff like you were talking about, you know, discovering bands in Perth from the live scene. I mean, that's always going to be where you are going to find... That's always going to be where you're going to discover... Yeah, although nowadays, yeah, you know, you can just, people are putting up stuff on Spotify before they even play a show or whatever. There's no many ways of doing it, right? There's no right way or wrong way. They, they all work um, or, or don't work. Um, so, yeah, I don't think... I mean, that's a particular... That's a particular way of doing things in a particular kind of scene, um, but you know, it's there's no, it's not right or wrong. Or, um, yeah, there's so many different ways of doing it. When you're doing a live set, or when we look at one of the albums, whether it's Jebediah or, or Bob Evans, mm. is the order of the songs important on a record? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, you me. put them in a particular order because yeah. you want to tell a story, you want to create an arc. Yeah, totally. Yes, it is to me, and again, that could be a an art form that is no longer that relevant anymore. Because I don't know, do, do people still value listening to a record from start to finish these days? I, I'm not sure. Um, because if you've grown up in the world of streaming, um, then you may not even own a single physical record, you know. Um, but I grew up with records and CDs, more so, I suppose. Um, so I grew up listening to records from start to finish and so when I make records, that's how I like to present them. Mm. And again, that's just sort of satisfying my myself. Do you actually have any songs which are like a part A, part B kind of song, even though they're separate songs? Um, uh, like, uh, I think I have like songs that are like, were act as bookend, you know, I, uh, I've made, a, made records where the opening song and the closing song are kind of bookends, uh. so they're... Um, and in fact, I made a record. One record I made was just the most that I've ever lent into this idea. Where I, before going to the studio, I worked out the track. Most of the time, I work out the track listing after I've made the record, after recording it. But this time, I, I've worked out the track listing before going to the studio, and 
because I wanted to be able to for songs to for one song to fade into the next and join songs together or whatever and you know and that was a really interesting challenge in trying to find a way of getting out of one song into another especially mm. if they were in different keys uh -huh. and stuff and you'd have to come up with a an outro that like was created a key change so that it would yeah. flow into the next one or whatever um and and you know tried to sort of have a kind of loose sort of concept around the the album a thematic kind of concept and everything but again this is all stuff that i'm just doing for my own mm. enjoyment you know like you can't exp like most people who listen to that record wouldn't probably not even yeah. notice yeah. <laughs> or care. <laughs> um, I, I did have one question I, I've got to ask. Where did the name of the album Braxton Hicks come from? I know what Braxton Hicks is. Yeah. Why, why did you call the album Braxton Hicks? I think I was reading medical journals at the time. I was, 2004, what was I? I was still, I was in my 20s, still years away from from uh, having children of my own, but I was I think I was just reading medical journals to try and find some interesting words. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I see. <laughs> you know, You're just a, fooling all of us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I mean, but this is a, you know, this is a, a, a relevant thing. I mean, like, um, sometimes, like, I mean, to, uh, I've I've gone to like art galleries, and used like or looked at paintings and and oh gone to art galleries not even so much to look at the paintings but for just for the little the title and the description <laughs> yes. right because they can give you great ideas yeah, yeah. For, for for songs um there's loads of different things like that where you can kind of pull inspiration from i mean paul kelly you know we're talking about sort of you know ripping you off like paul kelly is regarded as you know one of australia's kind of sort of modern uh, like our bob dylan yes um he is a prolific stealer. Right. A prolific stealer. And I, and I mean that with the greatest Cut respect. Cut that bit out, okay. <laughs> I, I, mean, I mean that with the greatest respect. And I'm, um, you know, maybe stealing is the wrong word. But whatever, that's semantics, doesn't it? The point is, um, he is always, you know, if you, he's put out some books and he, he talks about it. So he's pretty open about it. Um, where, you know, he's written entire songs that are completely based on a poem that someone else has written. Right. Um, um, and and he, he's quite open about li specific lines from poems that he's taken out and just changed a few words and used them. So, I mean, I think it's a funny area because I think as a songwriter, you know, we really, we have this inherent, we, we want to be original. And we, we, are, we, we think that, um, you know, do, sounding like something else or borrowing something, anything that isn't so completely unique and original is like... Um, wrong it's blasphemy you know it's like terrible well, i guess you don't want to cop the accusation either well no i guess you know but but i think that that's a really kind of narrow minded mm. way of th thinking about art mm. you know like the whole every all art that exists today exists because it's borrowed bits from yeah. what's come before and you know i think that we shouldn't close ourselves off from uh, or you, from from that idea, mm. um, obviously there are ways of doing it. And Paul Kelly does it very very well. Um, <laughs> you know, he does it like a true artist and poet. You know, but. Have you heard of the Beatles? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I guess, yeah, band, uh, a really important band for me when I was a teenager in Pajabat I when we started out, that not many people know of, is a band f from America, they're called Archers of Loaf. They were like a kind of noisy indie rock band. They were never really, they didn't, you know, I don't know if they even really got played on Triple J, they didn't really get played on the radio in Australia at all. We discovered them through friends and became obsessed with them. Um, in terms of bands that we played with, because there's a stack. I mean, there's heaps. I mean, been really lucky to play over the years, play gigs with 
so many of my heroes growing up. Um, you know, even to this day, a band like UMI, you know, really, really important to me. Um, they were sort of a bit massive inspiration when we started out and, you know, we've toured with them and, you know, Tim, the singer from UMI has sort of been somewhat of a mentor slash big brother to me and, um, and yeah, there are lots of cases that, you know, the le we played with the Lemonheads, I was a big Lemonheads fan when I was a kid, we played with them. Um, you know, playing with Silverchair in the 90s, you know, was a big deal, even though... I wasn't necessarily a massive Silverchair fan. They were just so important at that time as an Australian band that were like kind of taking over the world um, and, and giving opportunities to other Australian bands. Um, so yeah, there are, there's a stack. I mean, I, I could go on and on listing bands that have we've played with that we've got on well with and have developed good relationships with and that have been really inspiring. You know, it happens all the time, fortunately. <laughs> But, you know, I mean, it's the thing, if you stick around, I mean, there's this thing about longevity. But, you know, I'm at an age now where people often ask, oh, you know, what's the secret to longevity? And the simple answer is don't break up, don't stop. Right. I mean, if you just don't stop, you're going to stick around longer and you're going um, you, to you're gonna have more opportunities, you know. That, that is true, but Jebediah took a hiatus. We took a brief hiatus. Only like maybe three years mm. was when the, my solo stuff started to kind of kick off and we were kind of due for a break anyway. But um, When but you came back though, did the music style change at all? Um, I think it probably did. I think we, you know, you're hopefully always kind of changing and evolving and um, I think the inherent kind of parts that made Jebediah work between the four of us was still intact mm. and, and that element doesn't change and that's important because mm. that makes us who we are. But um, I think we certainly were a lot more adventurous um, in a lot of areas, um, you know, and I think that just comes with time and confidence. Was there any resentment from the band with the success of Bob Evans? I don't think so. I mean, there may have been some awkward moments here and there, but probably... That was all kind of put to bed when we got back together and made another record and it helped that that record was mildly successful. Um, but there was probably a period there where um, the, there might have been a little bit of insecurity amongst all of us in a way. I can remember like, you know, it was a strange time because the, yeah, the, the second Bob record, did, you know, was doing well and I remember being on a plane and reading a review of the album and the final sentence of this review said, you know, it was really complimentary, it was a real double-edged sword because it said, you know, if, if, if Kevin Mitchell can make records this, this good, I'm paraphrasing, I can't remember it, um, this could be the final nail in the coffin of Jebediah. Oh. <laughs> and, you know, so it was a really tough one to read because it's just like, oh, I'm, you know, you always love reading a good review. But then it was also pretty much saying, oh, your band with your best friends in the world are yeah. done. And so, um, and so that, that did kind of motivate me a lot to be like, oh, you know, I'll show you. Yeah. I'm going to get the band back together and we're going to be, <laughs> gonna be great. That's it. Um, so, so, yeah, the, any of those kind of little insecurities, I think, kind of got fixed up um, after a little while. Any other questions, uh, in particular songwriting type questions? Yeah? Yeah, I've just got a, a question about working with labels in the songwriting process. Is there any relationship with labels that you've seen that you would have found difficult? Is there any situation for a label that actually affects your songwriting process? Oh, yeah, sure. I mean, there are creative people that are working at labels. They're, they, they form a minority, but, <laughs> but they do exist. Um, publishing companies more so. And publishing companies are, you know, that's the area. They're the people that if you sign to one, you know, then they, they take over the responsibility of, of, um, of uh, selling, um, you know, making money from those. So getting those songs used in like advertisements or movie soundtracks or TV or whatever. 
um, which can be an important revenue stream. Um, uh, but it also means that you're signing away your, your rights as well. You, know, you don't own the, the music for a certain period of time. Um, so, yeah, there are definitely, in my experience, um, I've had people at record companies and publishing companies that have been really important. Creative soundboards, had lots of ideas. As an artist, it's always up to you at the end of the day, you know, what opinions you choose to listen to and what you don't and what advice you decide to take and what you decide to ignore. Just quickly, when you sign those rights away for that period of time, can you still perform those songs? Of course, yeah, yeah. Right. You're, so you're just, of course, yeah, you know, that's your bread and butter is performing. The, but, but yeah, you, you for, a, you know, an advance of money, um, they then take on ownership of the songs and they can sell them. Right. But, you know, it's not like they're going to go and just, you're just going to wake up one day and, find that you know you you this song that you wrote is being used to sell cigarettes or something yeah, you know? right, great, yeah. like there's always a collaboration involved like you know you you record publishing the I've only been with the same publishing company my whole life so we've got a good relationship and it's always like you know we're pitching your song for this you know and so there's always the opportunity to go ah, I don't want my song to be used for that for that mm. and then then they'll they'll respect that and mm. Um, but yeah, but no, I mean, in answer to your question, um, there have definitely been, you know, quite, uh, significant times in my career where people at record companies or publishing companies have been absolutely instrumental in making something happen, putting me, you know, getting me to work with a certain producer or that has changed the course of you know, my career and stuff like that. So, yeah, it, it, it can happen. Kevin, thank you. We're out of time. Thank you. Much appreciated, folks. Cheers. Kevin Mitchell. Thank you.